Hey guys, welcome to The Great State, and uh, today I'm going to be taking a look at IFAC and AFAC type stuff. We're still stuck inside. I hope everybody is staying safe along with you and your families and uh, avoiding, the, avoiding the whole COVID-19 coronas thing. It's still going strong. We just found out today that we got, got extended up till May 1st for our executive stay-at-home order from our governor here in the state of Indiana. So it looks like things are starting to clear up a little bit. Resist that temptation to go out, stay safe still flat in the curve. We're at that point right now where it's kind of getting a little critical as far as making sure that we're still doing and we're finishing strong and staying inside. So one thing that I've noticed, I've had some time to kick back while I'm not working is to actually sit and see, this is a great time to recharge and go out, learn some new things, go back, refresh some things, prepare. If anything, this has kind of shown us, you know, what some of our weak spots are and what we need to, you know, train up on and go back and refresh on, take inventory of, take stock, that kind of stuff. And then also things where we have those gaps that we've identified, go out and fill them, you know, go out, read, listen to podcasts. There's a lot of really cool stuff out there right now. And I think it's just made it a little bit more relevant and a little bit more urgent too in the times that we're in. So today, as we start turning that corner, I'm super anxious to get back out to the range like most of us and kind of get back to the core content that I normally have. I've picked up some really sweet rounds that I'm excited to go out, stuff that you guys have been asking for. And uh, on the personal defense side, doing some ballistic testing and stuff like that. But I'm just waiting it out right now. I'm going to be back at work next week. And then hopefully by that time, we can start getting to the range and start doing some safe stuff and uh, start bringing back some of the normal stuff. So hang in there. Um, today's going to be a cool one. I'm going to give you guys a perspective on IFACs and AFACs and how I change things up just a little bit and how I think about them at the range and then how they also translate from the range. Also, we think about them as a tactical product, but they're an everyday product. I've, and I'm going to share a story here about me and my son, about how I... Uh, patched him up real quick and I'll, I'll get, I don't want to steal my own thunder, but we'll get there in a second. So yeah, today, this is obviously, it's an AFAC. Um, before I get started, I want to put that, you know, that normal uh, blurb I put out there. All, I'm not sponsored. I'm not endorsed. I do all this stuff on my own accord. I'm just trying to share the knowledge that I have. For those of you that don't know, and you searched on IFAC and AFAC and you found me, uh, I am a nationally registered state licensed paramedic with a tactical certification. My scope of practice is, is about as high as you can get when you think of pre-hospital but it doesn't change how I think about things. And I actually try and keep things a little bit more simple. I do work in the streets. I work in a couple different agencies and uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about this kind of stuff when I'm not at work and making videos. So welcome. So let's talk about it today. So IFACs, you know, we're talking about individual first aid kits, commonly sold with tourniquets, all that kind of stuff. I'm a big believer in that it's really important that it, you have it on you. I don't really care about the vessel. It could be a fanny pack. It could be um, something from a company like Blue Force Gear, like we just saw. We'll get into that a little bit more. Or maybe like Dark Angel Medicine, North American Rescue. It doesn't really, it can, you know, like I said, it could be a fanny pack. I don't care. What's important is A, that you have it on you and that you're, if you feel comfortable wearing it. So that's point number one. Point number two is that you know what's in it. And then point number three is that you know how to use what is in it. And if there's something that you don't know how to use in it, that you don't, I guess that's like 3.5. Um, but that's where I'm really going with this. So um, I'll probably be putting out some other videos here when I start talking about gold standards and tourniquet application, that kind of stuff. I feel like I'd probably give, show you guys some pointers on how to achieve those speeds. Um, but for right now, I just want to show you what's in them and some of the considerations and something when you're like, well, I've seen a bazillion IFAC videos. Well, I'm going to show you something that I put into my IFACs that I've seen more emergencies at the range than in just an everyday life for this than any other thing. And it's something that you can make a direct impact on very, very quickly. And it will save a potential traumatic event at a, at a range while we're talking about that. So what's in my IFAC? Well, first and foremost, you know, it's gonna be PPE. I think I've been seeing more traction on this for a long time. Black tactical gloves are really cool and the old nitrile stuff. Avoid them if you can. Um, only because I'm not trying to make everybody not look cool. <laughs> it's because blue is a lot better for doing blood sweeps. It just shows up. If you wear black gloves, especially at night, good luck seeing where the blood's at on your hands and if you're catching any more when you do those sweeps. So blue gloves, lighter the color, the better if you're working at night. You can do some cool stuff like bear claw, whatever, whatever like the uh, FDE colored ones from North American Rescue and get those. Um, they tend to be a little bit longer. While that does give you some additional protection, I don't like them because you actually end up having to pull more off and it's just more complicated. So I like regular old hospital nitrile gloves, medical grade stuff, that exam gloves that I get for free. All right. Next big thing that is in most IFACs or should be on you is a tourniquet. It's also part of EDC. So um, this has been beaten like a dead horse over and over again. Get a good quality tourniquet. This one is from North American Rescue. It's in a genuine Cat 7. Make sure that you know where you're getting them from. Um, spending extra, they're like under 30 bucks, right? Um, if you pay full retail. And there's no reason why you shouldn't be. Get a couple of them, get a few of them, stash them all over the place. 
and dedicate one of them to making sure that it's your training tourniquet. If you're not able to get this thing on from when somebody goes bang, you should be able to get this thing on in 30 seconds or less on an extremity. Bar none. That is the gold standard. That's what we train to in TCCC, TECC, that kind of stuff, TPC. 30 seconds or less, you should be able to get this thing on completely and correctly. All right. And I'm going to go in a couple other things too. I'll, maybe I'll create a tourniquet application video for you guys. So CAT7 from North American Rescue. Of course, CAT stands for Combat Application Tourniquet. So it's tested as TCCC approved. If you can't get a hold of one of these, the other one that I would recommend is from uh, Tactical Metal Medical Solutions. It's a soft T wide. Works fairly similarly to the CAT7. It has a couple more things that you need to think about. Um, the benefit to the uh, to the soft T wide is it's got a metal windlass that you can use over and over again. The downside to it is, is that it's not as quick to deploy um, and it's not as lightweight. It can be a little bit more cumbersome. So both are great TCCC approved options. Like I said, uh, North American Rescue, they do make a blue one for training purposes. That way you don't accidentally mix it in with your other ones. Might be something to consider. Most important thing is you carry it and you know how to use it. All right. Don't buy counterfeits. Okay. Other thing is commonly in that I would have in my IFAC. I build my own. I'm not going to go out and buy a commercially available one because I get the stuff parts here and there. Even though I'm not compensated or endorsed, I do get discounts um, from different vendors um, because of my profession. So hyphen vents, chest seals. Halos are also great. You get two of them, one generally for an entrance wound, one for an exit wound. You seal both sides up. Make sure you know how to use them. Get appropriately trained if you don't. If there's only two entrance wounds and no exits, you can use one of each on the entrance wounds. It doesn't have to be an entrance or an out, an out, an exit wound. Can't talk today. Um, but yeah, sometimes people think that. Why, you know, there isn't one marked in, one marked out. They're both the same. Okay. Other things I carry in an IFAC. Israeli bandage. It's a six inch direct pressure uh, bandage. It does a really good job. So. You, what you would typically use with it is you'd use some like a clotting sponge or something yeah, or some gauze. I'll get to that here in a second, but your deep wound pack and you'd use something like this over the top of it to help with providing direct pressure. It's not as um, robust or as stout as a tourniquet, but generally if you can stop the bleeding from a wound with direct pressure, that's the preferred method. Um, one thing I do want to say about tourniquets I kind of forgot about here and this direct pressure brought it up. Stick with something wider. What we're learning about tourniquet application is there's this fancy term called occlusion pressure. And what you don't want to do is um, have something really narrow, like a rubber band, where you s basically wrap this thing around a bunch or like a bungee cord, I guess, more accurately, because those occlusion pressures, what they do is they tend to destroy tissue. And one of the things in the advancements of tourniquets recently is that we found with wider bases that it lowers the occlusion pressure, which means it basically disperses that pressure more against more surface it still achieves the same effect of stopping the arterial bleeds, but it does it without tearing the tissue that is directly underneath it. And that is huge when you think about recovery, nerve damage, and overall um, survival rate. So something to think about there, stay away from the bungee cord ones if you can. Um, and again, I guess if you're in a pinch, you need to use a belt or a handkerchief and a stick, something like that. It's better than nothing because you're still going to save a life. But if you can, go with a wider one because what we're learning about from evidence-based medicine is that the wider the tourniquet, the better and with a better patient outcome. So forgot about that. All right. Other things are covered off on combat gauze. This is a combat sponge. It's a little lighter. It's a smaller version. It kind of single use, kind of pack it in there. Other things, if you don't have, well... Israeli bandage. These are commercially available. You see them all of the time in IFAC kits. I've got a bunch of them. They're H&H &H, uh, gauze. They are vacuum sealed. It's a it's a compressed gauze and there's about 4.1 yards of gauze in this little packet. But what's nice about it is it's lightweight. It doesn't take up a lot of space and it's vacuum sealed. So it's very, very tight and fat. But once you open it up, boom, you get all this gauze. If you don't have these, you can always run the old drugstore and pack up rolls of gauze. This is called, we call it Curlex. It's spelled with a K, but it achieves the same thing. It's just not as nice of a packing when you think about a minimalist, minimalistic approach where it seals everything nice and tight. You've got a little bit more um, space that you have to account for. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I usually have an antiseptic towelette and a boo-boo case in my IFAC as well because let's be honest more often than not when you're out at the range you're going to get like slide bite or something on it or you're going to nick yourself or cut your finger things like that you don't want germs getting in there so I usually have an antiseptic towelette some antibiotic ointment in here along with some band-aids it's just common sense 
if you have it on you, why not? Now, here's uh, two things that I normally don't see in IFAX. One is going to be a roll of uh, basically um, transport tape from 3M. You guys can see it here. Um, it's medical tape. It's water. It doesn't tear. It's tape. Okay, but here is the biggie. So three times now while I've been out at the range, and I don't know if it's because we just have so much fun. We forget what we're doing. We don't eat the way we're supposed to do. We have a huge diabetes. You know, population with diabetes and they don't manage their sugar appropriately. They don't drink the fluids. They get dehydrated. They're out in the heat. Any number of things that can happen that cause a diabetic reaction and they become hypoglycemic. And for me, three times now, like I've mentioned, I've actually given oral glucose. And so I carry it. I've got three different versions here. I'm going to show them to you guys. Um, and the advantages and disadvantages to both. One of them I think is just basically just got advantages. But um, a lot of people will tell you just carry some hard candy like Jolly Ranchers, gummy bears, stuff like that. The thing you got to be careful with in a situation is two things. One, when people have diabetic emergencies, they start having what we call an altered level of consciousness. That means that they don't have an awareness to person, place, time, or event. They might start talking gibberish, all of these kinds of things. And if they if they decompensate quickly enough and they go further into a hypoglycemic state, they'll become unresponsive. So you want to be careful about anything that you put in their mouth that can become a choke hazard. Okay, you don't want them to aspirate on it, which is the fancy word for choking, and get it caught down in their windpipe. Okay, that's going to be a bad day at the range when you're trying to help somebody. You know, great intentions, bad execution. All right. So what we tend to do in pre-hospital, if somebody is alert enough to put something in their mouth to take an oral glucose, there's a couple options you can do. You can run over to a big box store um, that starts with W. They've got things like this. They're not very expensive. They're a couple bucks. Um, what I like about them is that they are a nice gel, so they're easily consumed. They're water soluble, so they go down very quickly with some water. Um, what I don't like about them is that there's not a lot of structure to the package. You basically tear away this top. It's like jelly in here and you start squeezing it in your mouth and they suck it down a lot like a goo or something like that that you would get a can at a camping supply store stuff like that or an outdoor outfitter um so it does do a relatively good job the downside is that it's not very directional you can rip it off and get a kind of a mess going on and the big thing for me is that oral glucose on the face does not mean oral glucose in the bloodstream for digestion it basically is ineffective if it goes all over the place so just something to consider with this one you need to be a little bit more careful but i do like the fact that it's uh, easily digestible um, quick consumption gel. Okay. This one came from a big national chain drugstore. It's a glute, they're glucose tablets. So they kind of, if you ever had the chewable vitamin C's, these are orange flavored. They have about four grams of glucose in each of them. And so they're going to have to chew four of them because normally what we would give is a 15 gram dose of glucose. And um, this is a pre hospital grade one that I have that I was able to procure. This is kind of like the gold standard of what we use. But it's 15 grams of sugar in one dose, and we typically double these up and give two of them. So a total of 30 if we can. This would be just a starter, right? This is an IFAC. This isn't definitive care. This is to get the process started. Um, but if somebody's altered, you're going to have four of these things that they're going to need to chew and swallow, which could be kind of a challenge for somebody that doesn't even know what day it is. All right? I'm just being straight up. The... Alternative is you get something like this. You got to pick it up. You got to find it. You got to source. It's called glutose. What's nice about it is you basically twist off the top and you put it between their cheeks and gums to actually start the uh, the absorption process. And it kind of goes down. You can wash it down with some water. Again, water soluble, a thicker paste, but man, it, it packs a lot of sugar in each one of these tubes. Um, it'll usually take a couple of them. So that's something to think about. If you guys are thinking about, it. I've ran into it three times now where people have gone um, started going just a little on the altered side and they start becoming, the, you, you'll see them, they'll, they'll, they'll appear drunk almost. You know, that's a good way to think about it. You, you're thinking like, man, dude, have you been drinking? What's going on here? But with that being said, one of the things, if any of you guys have taken any TCCC classes, like actually gotten certified or TECC or anything like that, and the one thing that you need to be careful with in that situation is a person, when they start becoming altered like that, they have they don't have an awareness and they don't have that safety filter like they normally would. And that's where accidents can really start happening on the range or just a normal everyday life, all right? So one thing that you want to do immediately when you start seeing it recognize is disarm the person safely, okay? Make sure you don't put yourself at risk, but that's one of the things that we learn in the tactical space. And, you know, specifically if someone's got other TBIs or things like that from, 
from shells going off and stuff like that or percussive events, you want to make sure that you're disarming them because otherwise they can potentially hurt other people, which will create a much bigger scale of events. That would be a bad thing, all right? So just be very, very super careful in that. But I've seen three different diabetic emergencies while I've been out shooting um, for any number of reasons. So something to watch out for, all right? If you don't know, um, do a bunch of reading on it. Go search on hypoglycemia and some of the symptoms and things like that, and you'll figure it out, all right? Okay, so that is basically what I have on my IFAC, which is my individual first aid kit, which is not necessarily for me. It could be to render aid on somebody else as a first start mechanism. Now, because of where I'm at and what I do, I generally also have an AFAC, which is an advanced first aid kit. But before I get into it, I want to start right here and say that it is a, my AFAC is a bridge device for me to get to that next level of care. Okay. It also allows me to render aid to more people. It's a lot of duplicates to what I would have in an IFAC, which would be on me at any given time. Um, and I'm going to explain it as I go along. And I'm going to show you some of the other considerations with it. All right. So let's take a look at AFACs. All right, so we're going to talk about AFACs now. And the thing I want to put out here is that AFACs are another thing that you can buy a commercially uh, pre-filled product or you can build your own. And uh, personally, I've taken them and I've augmented a commercially available one. And I've removed some of the stuff that would be considered advanced life support um, interventions, things that you need absolute training on, okay? And I wanted to keep them. I, I just want to be really clear here that when you think about things like needle decompression or uh, cricothyrotomies, you know, where you're actually making the incision and you're securing an airway um, through the tracheal line, that you're, those are things that are, should not be done unless you absolutely know what you're doing and you have the appropriate training and your license to do it, okay? And I um, pulled them out of this video and not only for this video, but because um, the other thing I want to point out here is that for me, the AFAC is actually a bridge device. It's designed where the IFAC wasn't quite enough. The AFAC allows me to do either more of the same stuff or it gives me more of a bridge opportunity and start setting myself for success. While the intent here is I grab my AFAC, which is always within arm's reach right next to me. And um, I'll kind of talk a little bit more about that here in a second, but it allows me to say, hey, so-and-so, go grab this for me from, you know, if somebody's there, you know, and go grab this. Because obviously I'm not going to decompress myself generally or I'm not going to give myself crank myself. So those things are out of the control if I'm by myself. The AFAC will allow me to make sure that I have what I need to basically stabilize myself. But if it was somebody else and I wanted to do those things, I would have the ability to do it. So I just wanted to throw that out there to be completely clear that some of the stuff that you would normally see, like those needle crank kits and stuff like that, I've just pulled them out of my AFAC because I, I just keep them in my other bag that has a lot more stuff in it. So that's where I'm going with that. I'll talk a little bit more as we're going. All right, so for me, without ado, I make multiple clones of these guys. They're medium-sized Trauma Now bags from Blue Force Gear. I absolutely love these bags. I've been using them for a few years now. What I like about them is they are a small-ish, very lightweight, minimalistic, very thin, but super strong pack that allows me to pack an insane amount of medical supplies in each one of these packs. And so much so that I've got about four, actually I have five of these things built up that are built as clones. So for me, a big thing about it is making sure that they are specced out exactly the same so I know what is in them, where it's at, so I don't have to worry about any of this, that stuff when, the, when a situation arises in a high stress environment where I'm trying to render aid. I can just get right to it and let my speed of work just kind of pick up from there and I don't have to think about where things are and what's going on, what kits, what, all that kind of stuff. So I just made up five clones. What's nice about them is you can keep them in your car. You can keep them on you. If you have a duffel bag and you're like at a sporting event in your backpack, you can have that kind of stuff in there. You can put them behind the headrest of your car. You can put them in your trunk. You can put them underneath your seat. You can keep one in your house. Heck, this one right here, this gray one, like legitimately, I mentioned this earlier, but my son had this uh, accident when he was about five. He was climbing a chain link fence to um, feed some ducks in a detention pond, slipped, fell, and basically... Um, impaled himself and cut right through his all of this tissue through his brachial tissues and everything went down to his humerus missed his um, brachial artery and his brachial nerve luckily basically just hit it just right but it went down to almost the, the bone and at the time I had this kit in the house I had um, had it grabbed it and from it was basically able to administer aid to him and he was all split open had him all packaged took him to the ER and he was good to go and he's um all the much wiser now it doesn't go scaling chain link fences that haven't been appropriately taken care of. So 
I guess the point there with that story is that it doesn't need to be for things at the range. I mean, you'll find that you can use these things on a daily basis. So think about that. Don't make it just your range bag thing. Put these all over the place and make them accessible for your everyday accidents that are going to happen a lot more often than um, range accidents. So just something to think about there. So I'm going to take this one and put it down there. All right. So why do I like the Blue Force Gear Tramanau bag so much? Well, it packs a lot of punch for the size and the lightweight of it. It's super strong. Um, they've got their patented Helium Whisper webbing system on the back here. So if you guys are familiar with Blue Force gear, they're battle proven. They do a lot of really high end stuff. And you see on my channel sometimes, especially in regards to my plate carriers and stuff, I kind of stay on the status quo. This is one area where I tend to go a little upper end. Um, you can buy a pre-filled kit. I think they're about 120 bucks or so. Um, but if you want just the bag itself, it's close to $79, I think, or something like that, if you find it online. But well worth the price, and I'm going to get into it here a little bit more, what I like about it. Other features that I like about it is it allows me to put another tourniquet right on top, and I do use their tourniquet now system, which is basically it slips right into their version of Molly again, which is Helium Whisper. And you can use these devices on anything Molly, so it doesn't have to be a Blue Force gear component, all right? So if you guys saw my plate carrier, I um, also have a Blue Force gear on that as well for my tourniquet now. Other things I like about it is it's zipperless. That is huge for me. The last thing I want to be worried about when I'm dealing with trying to get to gear is dealing with zippers. And all more often than not, I find that zippers on products like these tend to be subpar and it just eliminates that for me. So it's basically a tear away here and it's got a nice um, bead in this little tab right here so you can get a nice grip on it. The fabric itself is nice. Um, it's not rough by any means, but you can get a really nice grip on it without having to have grippy stuff. It just works. You, you find it, you slip, and there's no mistake. You're basically deploying this thing. The other thing I really, really like about it is that it allows me to put chest seals on the back here without having to pull everything else. So if we're thinking about this, if we are in a event where we need to do um, some very quick work for a gunshot, let's just say, all right, get into traditional AFAC stuff here. What it allows me to do is if I've got it here on my side, I can pull it right out and I've got my chest seals just like that. I got my pair just like in my IFAC, but it gives me a whole nother pair that I can just basically pull out and deploy. And I haven't done anything to the integrity of this pack. I've got a tourniquet and I've got chest seals just like that. Now, for whatever reason, I've never seen anybody or any other channels talk about the benefits of this, um, the trauma now and why you can actually just slide your, your, your chest seals in the back like that. Super cool. It's something I've done from day one. I thought, man, this is pretty slick. If I ever need to pull these things up, they're right there. Other things about the pack, um, they do give you your own serial number and the fact you give you your cage code, your NSN numbers, all that stuff. I'll put all that stuff in the details in this, uh, the description of this video so you guys can find it. And before I dig into it, I'm going to pull this out real quick because this is something I always keep very handy. It's a Sharpie. Sharpies are used in medicine for a number of reasons. They're easily visible. They don't wash away. They're semi-permanent. And you can write like your tourniquet times on it. If you're, for those of you guys who are more medically inclined, you guys are providers, you know, obviously if someone's had a spinal cord injury and they're having traveling paralysis and you're watching it climb because of some swelling and some compactness, and, and you got to worry about dermatomas and stuff like that, you can write your lines and basically mark where you might be thinking where, where that, how quickly it's traveling, things like that. So Sharpies are great for that. All right. So let's open this bad boy up and start gutting it. So tears open, right? And then what you got here is it pulls out and you've got an insane amount of supplies in here. And I'm trying to do it very gently. Obviously you do it much quicker, but here you guys can see exactly how light and compact. This is an absolute um, fantastic piece of kit right here in my mind. Minimalistic, but it does everything right. And then this thing basically bursts open with toys. So we open it up. So in this particular one, instead of the Israeli bandage that I had my IFAC, because I got a little bit more space, I do put the North American Rescue ETD, which is the emergency trauma dressing. It's essentially, it's like an, a, an Israeli bandage. It just does things a little bit better the way it kind of wraps around and how the, the ABD pad in it works. So that is right here. It's also got its own cage code number and NSN. I'll be sure to put that in the uh, description. Other thing that is really big that I don't see oftentimes in AFACs that I think is super important is that we often let our um, trauma patients um, get too cold. We, we don't keep them warm enough. And a good way to combat that is to use a Mylar space blanket. They're cheap. They're, um, they pack very well, and most, but most importantly, they're super effective. One of the things that we've learned recently is that 
the warmer we keep our trauma patients, even if it's 90 degrees outside, right? 90 degrees is still colder than the 98.6. You got to understand when somebody's having a severe amount of bleeding, they're losing that circulation in their body, right? They're basically, their closed circuit is now open. They've dumped all their, their ability to actually circulate fluids through that body. The pump works harder. Things start decompensating and they start going into shock, all right? So one of the ways that we combat that is we keep them as warm as we possibly can. The other thing that we know about clots is that um, they tend to form better when they're warm, all right? And in a trauma perspective, one thing that we think about is the first clot is the best clot. If we can get the bleeding to stop, we don't want to keep pulling bandages off and keep having it go and go and go. That's when problems start arising. So set yourself up for success. Keep your patient warm and you'll have a better patient outcome. So I always have a space blanket in each of my kits. And besides, even if it's not an accident like that, you're out camping, you're out in the wilderness, you're in a car crash, they work fantastic. It's dual purpose. All right. I'm just going to basically work from the top here to the bottom. So I've got Something that you find in a lot of pre-filled kits, this is H&H, &H, um, it's a uh, compressed gauze. There's about 4.1 yards of gauze in here. You would use this for deep wound packing, all right? And along with that uh, North American Rescue here, one thing that's really important about it is that it um, deep wound packing and direct pressure is preferred over tourniquet application if you can because it doesn't create the same risk of that, what we call that occlusion pressure and um, the risk of tissue damage underneath it. So. One thing there is direct pressure if you can, so you would use that in conjunction. I'll get to something else here in a second that's in this as well. I showed you the uh, the quick clot combat sponge, but I've got more in here. I've just got a non-adhesive gauze pad. More of the Curlex, which is the non-compressed gauze, but effectively works the same way. It's great for deep wound packing, okay? I've got a backup, another tourniquet in here. Now, the one thing I wanna talk about this, this is not TCCC approved, but it, a lot of agencies use it. It's called the SWAT T. You know, it doesn't stand for Special Weapons and Tactics. It stands for Stretch, Wrap, and Tuck. And what it is, is effectively a giant um, bicycle tube that's been kind of flayed and it's wide. So again, it gives us a nice wide base. The thing that is the hiccup with it is that it doesn't work well when it's wet. So if it's raining outside or you're dealing with a lot of blood, it's something to consider. You're really going to have to torque on this thing and find an anchor point to get it wrapped to the point where you get dry, um, it's it's dry on top of each other so that it can actually lock onto itself. And then once you get to a certain point, you basically tuck it underneath there. With some practice, you can actually get it to work in a wet environment. It just makes, there's some considerations and it's a little bit more difficult. So yeah, it's the SWAT T, stretch, wrap, and tuck. Very, very cheap tourniquet and it does an amazing job. Up here, I've got an NPA. So as I mentioned, my AFAC is not designed to be the end all be all and have everything in it. And I've removed some of the stuff from it. One thing I do want to secure though, before I get my BVM or some more invasive type procedures is I want to get an NPA in those people. So if I have to use a BVM, which is a bag valve mask for respirations, I can take care and start breathing for somebody, all right? The NPA at 28 French is a pretty standard size. I've also got lubrication on the back here. Little pro tip, if you don't have the lubrication packet, you can actually use spit just as well. The mucus in the spit will actually work almost as well. Do not use your spit if you can. Use the spit in the other person's mouth or blood. They will both lubricate this and kind of get it down and fish it down through. Make sure you know how to use these though. If you're not doing it correctly, you can actually go up through the sinus and stuff like that. So make sure you got training. Can't say that enough. All right, so let me move down here. Again, I've got another glutes, right? My IFAC is to, the design is I get my first 15 grams going into somebody. My second dose here, I can pull out of my AFAC, which is on my side. So it's kind of a one-two punch. And that's how I run this thing. More Neosporin, more gloves. I do have a pair of trauma shears from North American Rescue here. These are the smaller ones. They do an adequate job. Are they Leatherman Raptors? No, absolutely not. And I usually have those on me, but I like making sure that I'm setting myself up for success. And I have a pair of these in each one of my, uh, my trauma now bags. All right. Meds. I'm going to speak very quickly on this. So I kind of blurred the lines a little bit with my IFAC and I went from a pure trauma bleeding control kit and I introduced a little bit of medical emergency stuff in there with the whole oral glucose thing. So one thing I carry in my AFAC that I want to make sure that I'm being completely clear on, I want to show you that I have it in here, but I want to make sure that I'm not giving any false impressions or I'm not condoning anything that is not appropriate. So if you don't have the ability to do this or you're not comfortable with doing it, you shouldn't do it, all right? So I do have four baby aspirin in here for chest pain. It's for medical purposes, okay? And I also have some Benadryl in here for bee stings, things like that, 
all right? It's really important that you know what you're doing, even with over-the-counter medicines, because you can actually give aspirin to a trauma patient, and it works as a platelet. It basically it adds to the lubricity of blood, and it makes it harder for clot formation to happen. So definitely not something you want to give in a trauma environment, but being an ALS provider myself, um, aspirin is considered a basic life support medicine. Uh, so I do carry some four baby aspirins with me because I'm trained and I know what I'm doing. All right. If you don't know it, I'm not trying to sound egotistical or anything like that. I just want to make sure that we're all doing the right thing and not in, uh, intentionally, unintentionally harming somebody by trying to do too much or doing more than we should be doing. Okay. Um, I also keep Benadryl in there as well. Enough on those over the counter meds. Uh, some more ointment, triple antibiotic stuff to go along with the Neosporin and the towelettes and the cleaning and stuff like that. And then what I do like about this Blue Force Gear Trauma Now bag is it does have this little hidden pocket in here. So this is where I've got the clotting gauze, which is like the clotting sponge, just more of it. Allows me to do deep wound packing. I also have Vaseline impregnated gauze. So you would use this for abrasions, but what's more important that I like about it is not only do you have the gauze in here that you can use, you can actually use this Mylar packaging for an occlusive dressing, AKA another chest seal. You just gotta tape it down and you can leave one corner open. We call it a three-sided chest seal. So you can actually burp it if there's a tension forming underneath it. For those of you guys that know what I'm talking about, I just keep one of these in there. It's a nice little backup to a backup. Cause I've already got four chest seals on me, right? This is number five. And then if that's not enough, because we got multiple holes, I've got four sheets of Tegaderm in here. I can double those up and make more occlusive dressings. All right, so that's basically the tour of my AFAC. And again, like I said, the stuff that like the needle decompression stuff, the, uh, um, you know, the, the kite kit stuff like that, I keep in my other bag because I'm not going to be rendering those on myself. And if there's somebody here, you know, I got somebody else, I can have somebody go fetch that stuff for me and be pretty quick about it. So that's it. So hopefully you guys, you found this interesting. You know, it's, uh, I'm kind of looking for some things to keep the content rolling here while we're holed up and give you guys something to watch, something to think about. And if it interests you, by all means, comment. DM me at uh, Gray State Medic on the IG over at Instagram. I, I love the bi, you know, the bi-directional communication. I do this noth nothing else just to kind of share some knowledge and get people talking stuff like that. Like, subscribe, hit the little bell to get notified, and uh, continue to stay safe, guys. I mean, we're flattening the curve. Things are starting to look a little bit better, but let's finish strong. You know, stick it out. Don't be too anxious to get back out there and do things. And all of a sudden, we have a huge step back and stuff like that. Um, I'm going out on a daily basis, and I can tell you that it's not that cool out there right now. There's not a whole lot going on. It's basically everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. We just need to continue that until we get the all clear and uh, make sure that we're doing the right things for the right reasons. So that's it for this one, guys. Until next time, stay safe.